the onus is on us as providers to state where the value is in continuing this treatment, especially when it comes to the chronic pain workers comp population. Well, hey, Johanna, welcome to the show. How are you? Good. How are you? I am doing all right. I'm excited about diving into insurance denials, specifically as they relate to physical and occupational therapy. Before, before we dive too deep, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your experience, and what brought you to what you're doing now. Sure. Thanks for that. So I have been a physical therapist for 21 going on 22 years back in the good old days where all you needed was a bachelor's. So going in, in the early two thousands, you just had a different landscape as far as clinical treatment, where you were seeing patients three times a week, you could write your assessment, tolerated treatment well, and continue plan of care. And that was 50% of the soap note. And it was just fine with the advancement of HMOs and just cost containment. Um, that definitely changed as to what we know PT to be today. Uh, I spent the majority of my early career in outpatient orthopedics, some neuro, and I got into occupational health, industrial rehab, workers' compensation. And really, and I am bilingual, speaking Spanish and English. At the time, I was in Washington, D.C., and then moved to Chicago, where I managed a series of clinics that we did work conditioning, work hardening, functional capacity evaluations, and chronic pain management. Really working in that multidisciplinary approach, I got a taste of how important your documentation and being very specific as to why you're saying what you're saying because someone is actually reading it and making decisions. I think when we view our documentation as one way, a like unidirectional communication or unidirectional platform, we just kind of get lazy and say whatever we think because no one's really going to read it, right? So through that, becoming a quality advisor in a workers' compensation role, in my last role in workers' compensation, I was an area mentor where I would go into clinics and cherry pick work comp charts and just kind of give therapists that very constructive, actionable feedback on you're seeing this patient, you've seen them for 60 to 70 visits. How are you moving the needle? Help unpack that for me. So no one likes to be called out necessarily because we as therapists may get defensive, but really kind of holding a mirror up to those clinicians and saying, hey, I know that your skills are valuable. You know your skills are valuable. But if you're asking someone to spend resources on it, the onus is on us as providers to state where the value is in continuing this treatment, especially when it comes to the chronic pain workers comp population. And that really kind of lit a fire under me to document better myself. And when you're doing a workers' comp note, especially when you're iterating material and non-material handling, you need to be saying why you're, what you're seeing with that Florida waist lift, that waist to shoulder lift, what compensations are you seeing? And from that, that can justify, hey, this person needs more scapular strengthening because this is what I saw. So it was very easy. And I think every every therapist should be a work comp therapist because it makes you document better. So from that, that really kind of lit a fire under me. And about seven years ago, we relocated from Chicago to Charlotte. And I was just looking for a job, like any job that wasn't full-time clinic treatment, right? Pay me. I know things. So <laughs> I, I do know things. I'm kind of smart. So from that, I came across an opportunity with a major uh, third-party administrative company to do clinical review. And it was 100% remote, a complete 180 from what nice. I was doing, yeah. driving everywhere. So that was a little bit of shell shock. But my my husband and I moved. We bought a house. We did all the things and had a suburban. Now we got a yard with a dog. Great. What do we do? <laughs> so that really kind of opened my eyes to now. And, and I've been on peer-to-peer -peer calls. And you get the angry fist, the shaking angry yeah. fist, old man, get off my lawn kind of thing. But now having seven years later, having been on the other side of that, so basically for the last seven years, I was doing clinical reviews for Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial insurance companies. And through that, just really reading on a daily basis, just crap documentation, superfluous information, where you kind of want to call the therapist and say, what were you exactly trying to tell me? Because you generated a document that's saying a whole lot of nothing. Or yeah. it's a whole lot of not what too much of what we don't need and not enough of what we do need. And then there are times you get on a peer to peer call and you would be on with a very angry provider. And my mother, 
my abuela taught me one thing, right? She said, you have to separate the issue from the emotion. Yeah. And I think as providers, you just get too caught in the emotion and I get it. That's a, another soapbox, but I know you asked me about my intro. So finishing yeah. that up and we'll get to that. Um, so seven years as a clinical reviewer during that time, I had, had struggles with fertility and fertility and the whole, that's a whole separate other issue, but, you know, pregnant had my son, um, by IVF and through that found like, oh crap, there's really gaps in women's health. My yeah. own firsthand experience, you know, they try to induce me and have a C-section. I said, no, that's not what I need. So through that, I, um, about five years ago, got into pelvic floor physical therapy, got my certification through evidence in motion, started treating up until COVID that shut that down. So I have gotten that finally got my doctorate. So I'm with the rest oh, of the congratulations. Cool yeah. <laughs> Just like whatever. And I became a lactation consultant. So on the side, I do work with women virtually and families virtually on that, but kind of dialing into what the meat and potatoes of why we're here today. Through the last seven years, you just get fatigued of being able to not, a fatigued of not being able to help providers and share actionable feedback to them of what we need. Yeah. And I think so many times as we're always worried about covering our asses. I don't know if I can say that on here, but I just uh, did. You can. We're, we're always <laughs> wor we're worried about mitigating exposure. Yeah, liability and being, risk, right? Like, and I understand that, but all these social media groups we see that clinicians are in, well, I can't say this. And I, it's like, but what, if what you're saying is valuable and it's not, if it's inflammatory to a point, it needs to be to say, to communicate a point then it needs to be said. Of course, it needs to be constructive and supported with, you know, you know, don't just say this patient is awful. And they, okay, why are they not a candidate for therapy? Because, you know, they're worried about the Jim over Sibelius lawsuit and, and getting caught off. And you know what? I've been in this profession 22 years. I've done plenty of Medicare audits, plenty of Medicare treatment. No one has come to knock on my door, but I have been deposed seven times. And I will tell you, that's not a fun way to live. But having been deposed, seven times for workers' comp cases, the zoom out for clinicians is when you document and it is a habit for you and you establish those good documentation habits, then you can't question your, when you get questioned on your process, when you get deposed or you get a Medicare audit, lean into the good clinical habits and skills that you have developed and it won't steer you wrong. And that's not saying you, but that's not licensed to become lazy. Yeah. So all that is to say, my my fire in my belly, aside from the women's health component, which is there, my fire in my belly is to give PTs, OT speech, any any provider who takes insurance, very clear cut, actionable feedback on what insurance companies look for, maybe the pitfalls that you fall into. I'm not saying you avoid insurance denials altogether, because there are times that providers are just treating just gratuitously and unnecessarily. And that's another, that's another thing we need to keep in check, but that you just understand from the clinical reviewer side, what, what I see, yeah. what I look for, you know, what we look for so that you have that as a mirror to say, great. And now I take a look at how I document and how can I be more efficient, better and kind of cut the crap. So yeah, that answers. Yeah, I think that's a discussion we've we've had around the like the PTOT industry for a while. Like we document a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be in there. So right. before we dive too deep into like the the disconnect, which we're talking about happening here between what insurance companies want or what they're looking for and what clinicians end up putting in the note, like what I guess the transition that you've you've been on the the clinical side and you've been on the reviewer side. So as a clinical uh, a reviewer or peer to peer reviewer on the insurance side, looking at another clinician's documentation. What are those things that you're looking for? Because, you know, I own a PT clinic. I've worked in the in the space for a while. Like whenever there's a peer-to-peer -peer review coming up, either the admin team or the clinicians, like they're just looking for stuff to deny. So, and obviously <laughs> the people that right. are reviewing documentations aren't just looking, at least if it's an ethical company, aren't looking just to simply deny services to deny services. They're looking for a specific set of things. So as a, as a reviewer, kind of what, what are the big things you're looking for to say, okay, this justifies you know, more treatment or really this treatment isn't necessary. 
are there guidelines or a framework or is it an algorithm? Like how does that, how does that work on, on the reviewer side? And then we'll dive into the disconnect. Sure. So I think it's a both and. I think that some companies will use an algorithm with cursory information where you can input it on a web portal and it may give you a nominal amount of visits. Yeah. As far as it being a human reviewer, we're looking at, yes, age, diagnosis, comorbidities, and kind of that demographic information, but the why. Why are you treating this patient from your subjective and objective assessment? What are the impairments that you're treating? And what are the resultant functional losses that you're treating? And as the episode of care goes on, what benchmarks are you evaluating and reevaluating that either show progress, stagnation, or sometimes regression? And what are they, the quantitative and sometimes qualitative, but the quantitative benchmarks that you're using that show that, hey, this person is showing benefit at, from the result as a result of my skill care. And if they are not progressing, what are those barriers to progress and why only skilled care can help to address them? I think that therapists misconstrue. There's no question people will benefit from stepping into a space, being served, so to speak, being have hands-on, having that listening and validating ear. We can all agree that that is a benefit. Yeah, that's helpful. But but when is that benefit really marginally or no different than implementing what you have done for them and kind of taking the ball and dribbling it and, and running down the field, whatever sports analogy you want to take with yeah. that. So, yeah. Like at what point does, at what point does them coming in to see a clinician every week or every other week provide marginal returns compared to, okay, they've been given the skills, the tools, whatever, right. the exercises, and they can manage it on their own. Like what, what is the breaking point there? Right. And I think in an insurance-based setting, which is different from, like, I own a cash practice, that is a full disclosure. Um, but still when patients take super bills to their, out of net, they, I'm an out of network provider and they take them, I still have to meet the same criteria yeah. for the insurance company to consider that now the it's the patient problem at that point, because I have my reimbursement, right? Um, but to be very clear about the why. So for instance, and I this analogy, I don't ever like to compare human bodies to inanimate objects, but if you go and get a quote for some service that you need done, you're gonna want to know, and you say, hey, like I had my air ducts cleaned yesterday. They gave me a quote and line item each item, right? If they were just to say to clean a whole house air duct, it's going to be $2,000 to not get curious around yeah. the why. Exactly. The why value, are you charging me that much? <laughs> right. Then you must have more money than Bezos and, and God bless you. But I think that we need to have that same, because at the end of the day, healthcare is a business Yeah. and we, we as providers have to stay profitable. Insurance companies need to, everybody is, it, it really, unfortunately all is about the bottom line. So we do have to show value for what we are doing and why that value needs, it's important, right? If it yeah. were only the patient that needed to see the value, then it would be, we may be speaking a different set of criteria or value yeah. points or pain points to them than an insurance carrier. So as far as the criteria that we look for, number one, I wanted the why, what are you treating? And, and I'm going to say this, that pain is not a direct impairment. I will die on that hill. Pain is a, is kind of a, it latches on like yeah. a barnacle to different impairments or it may impede different impairments. Yeah, but it's it, a secondary in, condition. Right, it's underlying. not. Yeah. You know, we're talking range of motion, strength, balance, lack of proprioception, you know, those things that through our just special testing and all that crap that we do, that's what we uncover. And then from that, because of those impairments, what is the patient not able to do? They don't have eccentric quad strength. We know that's going to impact their sit to stand, getting up and out of a toilet, you know, putting on a, a pair of pants without sitting down, Think things that are mundane, but yet may be applicable. So when I'm on the phone with a provider, you know, the one pitfall, it's a frustration that I have is that we are, we're kind of, unfortunately, we can't really ask open-ended questions that uh, unfortunately at times is discouraged. But for me, if I were sitting and wanting to know more about it and I'm the gatekeeper between you and more visits, 
then I would want to know, please tell me what is going on with this patient. I'd want to ask targeted questions, but sometimes we, we as reviewers can be hindered because we can't be perceived as directing care yeah. or, you know, we really have to leave it on that provider end. So like, please let me know beyond what you've already submitted, what is going on with this patient or in your eyes, what are the barriers to progress or what are you seeing? I can so really you as the provider, knowing those key points of the why of what you're treating and what are those benchmarks that you are capturing and, and reassessing. You know, I can't tell you how many times where a patient or provider says to me, yeah, well, they don't have great balance and they don't have great, you know, their gait is off. And I say, great. Have you done a Berg to Nettie, you know, timed up and go, have you done their gait speed or two minute walk test? Well, no, that sounds like a good idea. And I literally want to reach through <laughs> the, the phone, phone and, and, choke say, somebody, yeah. and choke somebody. <laughs> like who, who let you graduate PT school and not, this is like PT 101. Why yeah. are we not doing that? And I don't know where. Or maybe they our... did it and they didn't document it. Right. Like, oh yeah, we did it kind of, we, we screened them as they walked in, but we didn't really document it down in the eval. It's like, why, why not do that? Right. And I will say back to doing a functional capacity evaluation, I assess sitting tolerance when the patient's in the waiting room. I, I purposely had my desk where I could see where the patients would park and watch them walk in. Because sometimes the way they walk from their car to the door was different than from the door to the chair. And that was curious. I was curious about that. So you're always collecting that data. And just know that the data doesn't have to be confined. Um, another point I will make is that performance-based functional outcome measures like a Berg, a Tinetti, a timed up and go, a five times sit to stand, um, six minute walk test or two minute walk test, a three minute step test. All of those are very easy to render. You can gather so much information from it and you can, it, it's research backed and all that kind of stuff, but it's so easy to assess and then reassess. I don't yeah. need every single assessment tool in the world. Because another thing I hear from providers, well, I spend every other note reassessing. It's like, well, pick pick a cursory amount of things, reassess, provide the data. But I don't give me a Berg on the eval, then a Tinetti at 30 days, then a, try to keep that consistency so yeah, we can, so you can see, see progress. progress. Yeah, yeah. I want to back up because I mean, you sure. just shared a whole bunch of value there. But backing up to what you said kind of near the, near the beginning of that, you said, okay, so healthcare is a business. We got to make the bottom line work. And then you did say something that I want to highlight. You said, well, if I was having this conversation with a patient about the value and what we're going to provide and all that, I might say something differently than what I say for insurance companies. I think that's something very, very important to highlight is that a lot of times as clinicians, we tend to see our, and I might get in trouble for saying this, but we tend to see our customer as the patient, but in an insurance-based model or workman's comp or something like that, really the, the customers who's paying for the, for the service, right? And in that case, it's going to be the insurance company in a lot of ways. I mean, sure, the, the patient might have a copay or they might be paying some kind of coinsurance, but the, one of the big stakeholders that we tend to forget, we look at them as an enemy almost, but they are funding the service is that insurance provider. And I think just that having that disconnect there, like you said, kind of the way we document is going to be a little differently or the way we explain value needs to be focused towards that audience. And when we're writing a note, a lot of times um, it's for the payer and the payer needs to understand what's, what's important, what's valuable and not necessarily the patient, right? Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that you may have the same assessment, but how you're pitching it to an insurance payer versus a patient is going to be different. You know, it's always that any business coach will tell you, you sell the vacation, not the plane ticket. You sell yeah. the good night's sleep, not the mattress. So communicating the, the optimal result of what your service can go, what you're getting towards, whether it's a reduction in fall risk, because I'm implementing these interventions to work on this impairment that I quantified by this functional outcome score. The patient just wants to be able to walk across the street and not worry about falling so they can, you know, if they're in an urban area, that's what's important to them. And you're going to say that same communicate that package, that same statement in a different way to the insurance carrier. But, you know, the biggest thing that, that people get frustrated about is ADLs. 
Now, yeah. most commercial insurance companies are going to follow Medicare guidelines and Medicare, you know, I can pull up the compliance rules, but in the benefit policy manual, more or less says if it's not related to an activity of daily living, we, it's not under our purview. Meaning that if the patient is at a community dwelling level of function, I'm Medicare, I don't give a rip if they can golf or not. I don't give yeah. a rip if they can hike. And to me, that is, I get it. But on the other hand, that kind of feeds into the whole, we're not helping patients and enabling them, which we are the best people leveraged to do it, to get more on the wellness side of things versus just hiring a trainer on social media, which I'll save that for another time. Yeah. But that is the Medicare guideline. So I will try to tease out on a peer-to-peer -peer or anytime I'm in front of that audience. Please help me understand on an ADL level, what is, is there anything your patient struggles with? Said so, so they may concurrently struggle with being able to hike or what have you, but if they also have difficulty going up and down a lot of stairs because they live in a, a third row yeah. or third level flat, great. That justifies the use of skilled care. So, you know, understand that we as insurance reviewers are not the enemy. We are arbiters of the rules that either your health plan has in place or Medicare has in place. Yeah, yeah. And kind of is what it is. Well, but, and I think there's that whole fact too, that a lot of clinicians and patients too believe that insurance should pay for everything, right? Like, oh, the insurance should pay for it. I'm having pain, yada, yada, yada. But I think there was uh, an example like Aetna commercial or something like that doesn't reimburse for sports medicine, physical therapy. Like if you have an orthopedic surgery, they'll pay for that. But if you tweet your shoulder or throw in a baseball, at least back in 20, 2021 or something like that, when we were looking at the, the rules, like they weren't going to pay for that. And I know clinicians are like, well, oh my gosh, why not? And there isn't this, the shift in the mindset to be like, okay, well, this now just becomes a wellness service that we're providing that maybe we pay cash or you charge cash for. It's a totally different thing. It's not medically necessary, quote unquote, according to the insurance company, but we know there's value there. And we know that there's, right. we're going to provide an improved quality of life. I think clinicians sometimes see it like, oh, if insurance doesn't pay for it, then they're saying it's not valuable. And that's not what that means. What it means is that the insurance is targeting a very specific area of right. function or functional performance. And just because right. they're not going to pay for you know, treatment A doesn't mean they don't think it's valuable. It's just not what they're covering, right? And I think that that needs to be part of the discussion as well. Like, okay, just because it's not covered doesn't mean that we're saying it's not valuable. It just means that you're patient is responsible for the cost, right? Right, right. And I think that kind of factors into, there's a meme that insurance is all about paying for some, paying a lot of money to get sick or get hurt and to pay a whole bunch more money. And yeah. nothing could be closer to the truth, right? That unless you have, you know, a pregnancy, it's kind of, we joke that about this with moms who have, you know, who have babies, right? Once you've met that deductible and out max, anything you need done for the rest of the year, you do all the things, right? I had two orthopedic surgeries the same year I had my son. So I, I just got it all done because it yeah. was paid for, but it, you're right in that it's just the reality of what we need. But, I, and I think that we're going to, you kind of can crap in one hand and wish in the other and see what piles up first that, yes, I wish that an insurance company would latch more onto the preventative, the wellness type things. And I think you're starting to see that with some yeah. incentives, but, you know, for instance, when I was working for an insurance company, we were basically self-insured and they would offer up to eight virtual physical therapy visits that you could use for whatever you wanted, which I thought was kind of cool. I mean, I'm a PT, so I don't use it, but all the other people who work for that company that didn't, that's a nice service that they're providing. So there may be within the employer benefit package stuff that your company offers. But for instance, there are certain things that should be just standard of care. Anyone who has a wellness, like at a certain age, why don't you go see a physical therapist to kind of look at overall movement? And, and that would be a nice way maybe to get that stream of referrals, not just wait until someone has it. They fracture a patella or they get an ACL reconstruction or have a wrist injury or what have you. But I think it, that that's kind of zooming out and, and where are the gaps in our healthcare system, which that's, that's like 10,000 bajillion yeah. podcast episodes. But as far as, you know, that you're stating again, I will say it 10,000 times, but being very, very clear on your why for treating the patient. And I think back to your point, the why of treating the patient 
you're kind of coding it, phrasing it differently for that insurance company, but also being very key to the patient of listening to what their goals are and kind of learning to, to reverse engineer or distill that into, hey, I'm not able to, you know, for a lot of my patients, I'm not able to pee without, you know, I can't start a, a urine stream without straining. That's a big deal to them. So I have to code that and to say, okay, what may be going on based, and I'm compiling that with my internal external assessment to the payer, but that's a goal for them, right? So a goal, if you're in a sports situation could be, I want to be able to play soccer and run and cut and jump, you know, without feeling instability in my knee. Great. You have your subjective objective assessment, and now you're filtering that and communicating that to your payer. So I think that, and you're being able to clearly state it. It kind of all filters down. The SOAP model is just, it's, it's old as, it's old as heck, but it just, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. It's old as heck, but it's like, it, it, it works. works. Yeah. It works. And being again, cognizant, clearly stating your objective information, be cognizant and intentional about your wording, use functional outcome tools that are appropriate to your patient. You know, what I get on the phone that, um, you know, most commercial or most TPAs or your third-party administrators may have a cursory number of what I call the cardinal outcomes tools. So your NDI, ODI, NDI, ODI, Quick Dash, and your LEFS. You know what? You are not contained. I for the mic people on the mic at the end of the other microphone, you are not contained to only those four outcomes yeah. tools. There's so many, there's an inordinate amount. Rehabmeasures.org, which is funded by the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab out of Chicago. They have, if if you have a diagnosis or a patient population that you want to assess, just search the database. They have so many good outcomes tools that I have come across. You know, the functional independence measure, the, you know, the PFDI and the POPD are specific to my population, but so many good ones that are just focus on your situation. Yes, the LEFS to me is useless if you're talking about someone in their 70s who had a hip replacement. They're not running three blocks. They're yeah. not doing that. That's not on their bingo card for the day. So you pick what does matter. Gate speed. That's not going to matter to a 16 year old, but it is going to matter to somebody maybe in their 60s, 70s. So again, that you're using the functional outcomes tools that are appropriate to your patient. Don't use the excuse that whatever's on the sheet is all I can provide. Cause I'm telling you, I'm giving you the permission you don't need. If you want to say they walk in the clinic, their step length is this, and and it took them this long to walk this distance, great. Or one thing I used to do when I worked skilled nursing, I used to watch somebody get up off the toilet. You know, they had shorts on or, you know, under underwear, whatever. I wanted to watch them pull their pants back up. They just had a knee replacement. So how were they able to do that? That mundane task, I mean, being able to time it and watch it and comment on it then time two weeks or what have you, I time it, I watch it, and I comment on it to be able to say, you know what, this person is able to do that. And I think those little mundane things we overlook, but kind of zooming in, that's what's relevant to our patient. So all that is to say that the performance-based functional outcomes tools, of which the, the four that I mentioned are not, um, they're there, they're data points. But on top of that, watch somebody what they do. Watch them what they do. Can I time it? Can I quantify or qualitatively describe certain things about how they're doing it succinctly? And then I, I watch them do that same thing, taking off and putting on their shoes. So it's just thinking outside the box of what I can do to capture for that reader, the insurance company reviewer, um, how the patient's doing. Because all the fun, fun stuff that we do and all the interventions and the ultra G treadmill and all the good fun stuff. That's great. But it also incurs a lot of costs, a lot yeah. of flash. What results is it yielding? You know, I argue and what, you know, my next venture is that I don't, when I have a patient, you know, the virtual patients I see what they need is themselves and, and a four. I, I try to minimize the equipment they need because that's yeah. another barrier to doing replicating this outside of the house or outside of the clinic. So you and avoiding the fluff. I think that it's there is a certain EMR system. I don't know if it's you know WebPT or what have. And I love WebPT. I love those EMR systems because I think they kind of corral the cats, so to speak. Yeah. Um, 
but it's the situation is evolving with changing characteristics. It's just some BS statement that's there. I'm like, why is this there? It says nothing. Yeah. So again, reading your statements, what is this saying? And if it's not saying anything, take it out. Okay. I'll pause and I'll let you ask. No, I mean, that's, that's good. I think again, like a point too, is the idea of like reducing costs. I don't think clinicians, we might be a little bit cognizant of it for patients, especially if they have a copay or coinsurance. Um, but if the ultimate goal is re like increased efficiency and improved clinical outcomes at a reduced cost, that does have to translate over to the insurance company, right? And at some level, like the only lever that the insurance company can pull on is either decreasing reimbursement or denying care, right? Like they can't do much else to reduce the the how much you're spending on healthcare. Right. So it is only natural that we've over the last what couple of decades we've seen the the amount of reimbursement going down and we're also seeing the amount of denials going up because there's there has not been much of a consistent effort on the PT OT side of things and I'll say this as a as a practitioner and a business owner like we have not been doing our part to make sure that the insurance companies are saving money right we've we're focused on getting the patient you know pain free or whatever but we're not worried about is this the right number of visits? Can we cut visits out? Can we do whatever? And part of that is the skewed incentives in healthcare, fee-for-service model and all that. We can dive into that later. But right. there, it is almost an, a, a logical conclusion. Like we were going to find ourselves in the situation where we're at now, right? It's just right. part of the part of how healthcare is paid for and who's paying for it. But um, right. so I guess kind of wrapping this up, what are, what are some of the big tips? You've already given a, a lot about you know, documenting actually what you see and your thinking and the why, but what are the, kind of like the two or three main tips you'd give a clinician to avoid either a peer to peer review or an insurance denial? Cause I'm assuming sure. if you can document it well enough ahead of time, you can avoid some of those peer to peer calls down the line. Right. Correct. Correct. And I will, and that's kind of something, frankly, I've gotten into trouble for, and I, I'm kind of, you know, scratching my head with one finger when I listen to that feedback from the powers that be, because at the end of the day, us as clinical insurance reviewers, our customer, if we're going that route, is the provider. Yeah. We are there to service them and be the arbiter agency of the insurance company to give them the yay or nay. And by the way, a peer-to-peer -peer review is not the end-all be-all. There are always next steps. So please, providers, if you're on the phone with that insurance reviewer, then ask them, ask them that what is the next step in this process? Cause maybe some, some companies out there may not state that or read the facts that we send you, please read that. Cause I know, and it, you know, I know it's another thing to do and the administrative burden that this process puts on providers. I, I really want to scream some, I, I do scream sometimes not on a podcast though. Please, 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 please try to concise or read that to prepare yourself and ask what are the next steps. But as far as avoiding the peer-to-peer, -peer, be very clear about the impairment that you are treating, the functional loss, whether it's the patient goal, you know, the patient wants to be able to do this, or you are seeing what maybe they're not doing as optimally as you would like to see them doing. So the impairment that you see, the functional ADL related loss that that impairment is limiting, and what scope of interventions you and only you are doing that only a skilled provider can do or the majority of which that supports, that kind of sequence supports that patient being in your four walls instead of in their own four walls and being extremely clear about what that is. As far as the, the data, again, we've talked about performance-based outcome tools versus questionnaire-based outcomes tools. I lean more towards Tell me what the patient showed you, whether it's a formal Bergtonetti, blah, 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 or it's, I had them sit and take off a pair of shoes. And this is what I saw. They didn't have sufficient external rotation. They had to, you know, do, they had to rotate and side bend at their lumbar spine to get that movement. Great. That tells me something. And number three, <clears throat> um, I would, I would say avoid, please avoid the fluff. That whole impairment, functional loss, this is what I'm doing. 
should be enough for me to say yes. And then you repeat that process at eval and reeval to be able to say yes or understand or identifying what those barriers to progress is. Um, and just a couple of disclaimers, do not, please, 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 Mia Boelita, she told me, do not confuse the issue with the emotion. I understand, and you are the one who's gonna have to hear that patient bitch on the phone. And I understand as someone who has had care for my son denied, and I've had to write a formal appeal and a grievance and talk to, but I know the system and I leverage what I know to get the results I need. So understand that that is a valid emotion, but it doesn't help solve the issue. So yeah. deal with the issue by all those tips we just outlined. Please do not catastrophize or threaten your reviewer. It doesn't get you anywhere. <laughs> like it legit doesn't because I understand, but I will just say to abusive callers, you know, I'm sorry, I have to terminate this call. It seems we're not able to achieve a productive line of discourse. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's nothing I, you I do get, once they hang up the phone. <laughs> I, I can't. Right. And I, I just, I, I want to help you. It's, it's kind of like Jerry Maguire, help me help you. I'm dating myself by quoting that movie, but help me help you. So why and only why is continued skilled care necessary? Again, communicating your why. So listing, again, the problems are superfluous and ineffective documentation, missing the mark with your reader, and increasing friction points to care access. Like, we all don't want that. So again, you want to evaluate your documentation habits. And am I following that, that steps I outlined? You're including clear and objective information, keeping it simple, the meat, not the fat. I love me a good... Yeah. I love me a good Wagyu steak. Like, don't give me a ribeye, please don't. So that all being said, I, any other questions for me? This has been a supreme pleasure to just vent. It's yeah. like Festivus. No, but, it's been yeah, great. It's been yeah. wonderful. Um, where can people, because I know you, you've done a webinar on this in the past. And I think you've got some stuff coming up about this. So I do. where can people connect with you about sure. this? Uh, learn sure. more about what you're doing. Maybe see some of these webinars that you're coming out with. Sure. Sure. So yes, I have done a couple of webinars, my top three tips in avoiding insurance denials. I will be doing that again in early Q1 of 2024. So I am at the Nourished Nest PT on Instagram. You can also find me on LinkedIn. If you go to www.thenourishednestpt.com, it is a D. Um, in there, you will see on my work with me or for clinicians page. So that's kind of where it is. Okay. Um, and I will, I do work one-on-one. -on -one um, with clinicians to kind of review documentation, give you my tips. I just finished up, you know, with one case that was extremely lengthy, but again, I'm trying to give you tips and tricks to kind of get that documentation reined in for your reader and just help you, you know, using documentation as the best way you can advocate for your patients. Cause it may be the only representation of the services that anybody reads. So yeah. I, I want to help you help your patients. Really, really, I do. So um, I appreciate your time, Rafi. Am I yeah. saying your name right? After I yes, you did. <laughs> That's awesome. Appa. All right, man. So, I appreciate it so, so much. Yeah, thanks. Have a good one. We'll link to everything in the show notes. All right, sounds good. Have a good one. All righty. All right.